The Hungarian master Gyula Breyer is unfortunately another incredible chess player whose career was cut much too short. As he rose through the ranks in the early 1900s, he established himself as a leading hypermodern thinker and top player, but World War I intervened, cutting off his access to tournaments. Soon after World War I concluded, he passed away at a very young age from heart disease. In this tournament from 1914, he plays a brilliant game against Siegbert Tarash. Unfortunately, this tournament, Mannheim, one of the top tournaments featuring many elite players, was actually stopped because World War I began. In fact, many of the players in the tournament, primarily the Russian players, were arrested at the event and interned in Germany. Breyer begins the game with e4, and after e5, we quickly go down well-trodden territory with an open Rui Lopez, which is one of my favorite Rui Lopez's, and I'm always excited to see it, even though it's considered maybe a little dubious on the top level. Certainly at the time, the theory that we have today wasn't that established. So here on move 11, we see a challenge to the knight on e4, and this is a theoretical position. I'm not super clear on all the theory. I'm not an open Rui Lopez specialist. I'm just an open Rui Lopez fan. So at this point, there are many choices that make sense for black. You can play bishop g4, knight c5, queen d7. All of these are okay. However, Tarash here goes for pawn to f5. Now, one commentator... Uh, commenting on the game said that the only explanation for this move is that the older master had simply forgotten about the possibility of en passant in the position, which is funny and cheeky um, and quite the thing to say to your vast superior because Tarash was a tremendous player and still a tremendous player at the time this game was played and the commentator was not nearly so tremendous. However, this is a significant mistake, and it is surprising that Tarash went for this move. After f5, we do simply capture en passant, and knight takes f6 makes the most sense because you need to keep some defense of this uh, d5 pawn that is definitely weak now after this transformation, but Briar has a great move here. I think the position would probably be good without this move, but knight g5 really puts the screws to black. The problem is that you can't really retain this bishop, and with the loss of this bishop, then this becomes really weak, and also white gets the bishop pair in an open position. That's really quite a lot to concede here. So bishop f7 is played. We simply trade that off. Very happy to do that. Knight f3, now an excellent move. The knight is eyeing a lot of very sensitive squares, in particular d4 is one critical square in the open Rui Lopez. We get queen to d7. White was actually threatening knight g5, and after rook f8, there was a fork that would have won an exchange here. And now queen to d3, mobilizing more pieces, bishop d6, and bishop g5. Trying to go after the knight on f6, that is the support for this pawn on d5. So black is really coming under a lot of pressure here, tactically as well as positionally. Now, knight e7 pulls the knight back to add support to the d5 square, and also it prepares c6 when the d5 square will no longer be such a tremendous weakness in the position. After bishop takes f6, of course, you'd like to play rook takes f6, but here that would just mean the loss of the d5 pawn, so that's really out of the question. So after bishop takes f6, you need to take back with the pawn, and now white cannot win the d5 pawn, because of simply the classic discovered attack here, classic puzzle rush right here, d5 falls. So after g takes, we get rook a to e1, accessing the open e file here. Black plays pawn to c6, supporting this uh, d5 square, which makes a lot of sense, but the light squares are really, really weak. Now, in this position, Briar goes for something spectacular. It really makes the game the special game that it is, but it's also objectively a mistake. A simple move here like bishop c2 would have maintained an excellent advantage. Obviously, white has a great pawn structure, control of the light squares, uh, access to d4 here, and then onward to f5 potentially. So he didn't need to force the, this position. Just pulling the bishop back made a lot of sense. However... Knight to d4, really exciting stuff, and now pawn to c5. Having just put the pawn on c6, the move knight d4 from white now um, allows this c5 push, and suddenly c4, forking the queen and the bishop, 
is in the air. Now, I feel really confident that Briar had seen this coming and had prepared the next move. Rook takes e7. Now, I have seen commentators give this move two exclamation marks. Exclamation marks. I wish that I could do this. Unfortunately, objectively, it's really not the strongest move, but the ideas are really nice. The game that results is really nice, even if objectively this could have been held by black. So of course, the main point is that you're eliminating the defender of the two critical squares in black's position, f5 and d5. So black captures back with the bishop here so that the queen now uh, participates in the defense of d5, which makes sense, of course. And now knight f5, so that d5 is under attack, c4, forking the queen and the bishop. Of course, this doesn't actually win material, but it's still a great way to try to defend d5, but can't really afford to lose that. If black loses d5, then white has total control over the light squares, and that alone is going to be enough for the exchange um, when you also have a pawn in tow. So queen h3 now, very nice move. And of course, in this position, you cannot capture the bishop because of knight check. And it doesn't really matter that you're forking the rook on f7. What does matter is that you're winning a queen here on d7. So that's really good stuff. So after queen h3, here's where Tarash made a mistake here. Um, I think that this is also an example of maybe a bit of the weakness of Tarash. He was a very classical player. So... I think that he didn't always sense opportunities to play extremely dynamically in complex positions. He wanted to play in a very uh, classical style, putting his pieces on natural squares. Strong here for black was actually king h8, stepping out of dangerous knight checks that would win the queen, and thinking about using the g file here. Also, bishop to c5 in this position simply puts the bishop on a really nice square here, uh, and black stays quite active in this position. Yes, you have this move, but if you go for this check after the king moves over, you actually have a couple of moves. The fact that this is under attack and this is under attack means you're not just going to win an exchange here, and actually the position turns out to be quite good for black. All of this means that black can actually hold the position here after queen to h3. Yes, white does maintain compensation, and I probably think that the computers overestimate black's advantage, but this would have been definitely the way to, for black to play king h8 or bishop c5 and not bishop f8 is played in the game, which is just too passive. So after bishop f8, of course, the bishop needs to fall back. It chooses the d1 square, which allows it access to great squares on the king side. And another passive move, queen c7. Again, king h8 makes so much more sense. And now it's all going to go Briar's way. So we get bishop h5 hitting the rook. The rook goes to the only square that's available to it. Of course, if you give back the exchange, then white has a great knight versus a bad bishop, control over all the light squares, quick control of the e-file. So it's really not an option. You must try to hang on to your material advantage. Rook e1 now played, seizing the e-file right here. Rook b8. I have no idea why rook b8 was played. But anyway, rook b8 was played in this position. Now queen h4, tickling this f6 pawn. So black goes ahead and plays bishop to g7 to try to defend it. And now bishop e8, really nice move here, sliding into black's eighth rank and attacking this rook here on d7. The rook falls back, attacking the bishop, but now knight to e7 check. If you try to run over to f8 to attack these pieces, white just has this move, and you can pick up the bishop, but you get mated on the next move, so a little bit of a pro and con there with a really, really big con. Now, king h8 here, and then we get a bit of a repetition. Check, and we just repeat moves for a moment, but now it's time to continue playing for the win. Of course, white is just getting a little bit closer to... Uh, the 40th move, I think, and also gaining more time to think with the repetition. Bishop f7, really nice move, closing off the g8 square so that now this would be checkmate. The king will have nowhere to go. h6, you're sad to play a move like this because it just means that the light squares are that much weaker. I think when you play h6, you know that your position is absolutely toast, but you just don't have a better move in this position. So h6. Queen h5 encroaching on the light squares. Big threats include check and then getting something over to f5 maybe. Uh, rook to f8, knight check, king here. 
You're not going to win back the exchange here, even though that would win the game. The pieces are just too nice. And so bishop e6 is played heading to the f5 square. Um, now black needs to open up the rook's room so that bishop f5 just doesn't totally choke black. And you just take it, and black tries rook f6, but this is obviously going to be a winning position. Now we have a nice fork. We hit the queen and the rook. The queen moves, and we pick up the rook. At this point, we're clean two pawns to the good, so that's going to be enough to win the game. Rook e6 is the most accurate move, pointing at h6, still keeping an eye on e8. And after queen g5, black resigned after rook to e8 check. So here, unfortunately, the king obviously doesn't have any squares to go to. If you block, I will just trade queens, and then I'll pick up your free rook over here on e8. And... If you hear trade like this, then you have to block with your, your bishop here on f8. I'll take it. Then we'll trade queens, and the game is completely over, of course. So very, very nice game here from Briar against the legendary Tarash. I hope that you've enjoyed the game. If you did, please do like and subscribe and hit the bell to support the channel and be notified of future videos. And of course, click on the playlist on top of the board to see more brilliant chess games.